If you'll bow your heads with me now in a word of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I pray you would prepare our hearts to receive your word this morning and open up our ears to be able to hear the words of Scripture being read. And Father God, I pray that you just empower me this morning to be able to deliver your message in a way that is faithful. And Father, I pray that we would take from it what you would put on our hearts this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> if you will, turn with me inside of your Bibles <clears throat> to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. Actually, this is going to be the last one in Matthew chapter 6. So, we've made it. <laughs> Matthew chapter 6. It's been a long time <clears throat> inside that chapter. I'm going to be reading Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. So, Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. If you're reading in the Pew Bible, page 685 in your Pew Bible. 685 in your Pew Bibles. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. Page 685. <clears throat> It reads, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. <clears throat> You know, I wish that I could think of a way to do a long series. There's plenty of verses right here, but I wish I could think of a way to do a long series on today's topics and break it up like a couple of weeks here and there. But the, this is the largest passage we've done for quite some time, actually. We've been doing like two or three verse segments for quite some time, and I, I just couldn't find any way around it. This is all communicating one idea. It's all cohesive. It's all pointing to one idea within this uh, paragraph or paragraphs uh, that we just read, and it's the fact that Jesus emphasized it in so many words indicates that he was really serious about this one, that there's something he was really strongly trying to communicate. Now, don't get me wrong, he's serious about all of his teachings, but there's something that he really wants us to take away from this. And to me, it seems to be saying this issue was and does persist in being one of the biggest problems of both the secular community and the fellowship of the saints. It is almost more of a condition of humanity than even really a problem, so to speak. Our topic today is do not worry. Do not worry. Now talk about a topic that is easier said than done. But think of Jesus' words as he gets Preaching this supremely important portion of the message, he refers to his listeners as you of little faith. What was Jesus saying by referring to his listeners as such? He was saying that worry is a faith problem. It only makes sense that if we truly and fully trust God, we wouldn't worry about anything. So let's get into this passage. The first thing that we've got to ask ourselves when we're studying any passage of Scripture, especially one that starts off the way this does, is when we see the word, therefore. I wasn't going to do it, but what is the word, therefore, therefore? I wasn't going to say it, but there it is. 
we have to ask ourselves, what is the therefore all about? It indicates that whatever he was saying prior to speaking on anxiety should lead us into not being worried. Think about it. He said all these things, and then he says, well, therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. So everything that he described in the lead chapters leading up to this should tell us we shouldn't worry about anything. We should not have anxiety. Now, I know I've done this a couple times already, and I promise I'm going to make it a lot faster than what I normally do, but I'm going to have to do a brief recap so we can understand this within the context of what we are reading in the context of the grander Sermon on the Mount. And if I were to summarize the majority of the Sermon on the Mount leading up to this spot, if I were to do it in just one sentence, this is what I would say it is saying. Do the right thing in God's eyes. Do the right thing in God's eyes. Think about it. All of the false teachings of the Pharisees promoted people on satisfying their pride, on satisfying what people thought would be right under any given circumstance. And Jesus' response, and I said this over and over again, you probably got tired of hearing this, but on the same token, Jesus' response to all the false teachings, he would start off by saying, you have heard that it was written, so he's implying that there was a teaching attached to what was actually written by God, and the teaching itself was not communicating God's word accurately. And he said, you have heard that it was written, and you talk about the topic, and then you respond by saying, but I tell you, but I tell you, the pride of life is enticing. It lures us the way that Eve was lured by the serpent to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Our fear is that if we don't have X, whatever X may be, we will fail to have lived a full life. And when I say that, notice I say that our fear, fear, or worry, anxiety, Jesus said, do not worry. Do not fear. Now, isn't it fascinating the types of things that we worry about? And in many respects, I would say they're not totally ill-founded or illegitimate. I mean, we have real problems that we deal with. But I looked up some statistics on things that people are worrying about these days. And did you know that about 80% of people are anxious because of inflation today? Unemployment anxiety is also on the rise. I didn't get an exact number on that, but I've talked to a number of people that say that they have been laid off or that their company is talking about laying people off. And so that's on the rise. Furthermore, 40% of Americans fear the future and 36% say they are more worried about the future today than what they would normally be. Now, it's statistics like this that frustrate me. It frustrates me that these people can't be here at this church today, this Sunday morning, to hear about Jesus telling us that we should not be worried. Jesus tells us how to handle these fears. The last thing Jesus said before saying, do not worry about our life was, do not store up treasures for yourself on earth. You cannot serve both God and money. And that's when we get to the therefore, right? That's when we get to the therefore, right after that statement. So you heard Jesus and you heard the statistics. He said, do not store up treasures for yourself on earth. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, do not worry about your life. And let me read those statistics again, just to remind us what it is that we're talking about, our fears. 80% inflation has to deal with money. 40% fear the future, and I guarantee you a lot of that has to do with incomes. And a rising number of people fear unemployment. Why is that? Because that's where we get our pay from. We get paychecks from our employers, and it's troublesome to think that we might not have that job. I think that Jesus would be telling us, would be referring to us today as OU of little faith. And he wouldn't be saying it in a disparaging way, but in a way to remind us that we need to actually have faith. So he's right in saying we have little faith, but he's also encouraging us to know that we could have more faith. 
We fear so much not having money, not having possessions, not having experiences, and not having jobs. What did Jesus tell us at the conclusion of this section? Your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And what happens when we seek, say, a bigger house, a fancier car, a big screen TV, expensive phones, the biggest salaries that we can possibly earn? Well, first we have to acknowledge, and again, those things aren't necessarily bad, but first we have to acknowledge that if we are chasing after those things, we are serving money, not God. And second, you load yourself up with all sorts of anxiety because you're always trying to find ways to get them. And then once you have them, you have to do everything you can to hold on to them. Here's a little secret. Average household debt in America. Any idea what it is? Average household debt in America. Josh, I don't think you're going to say something. If not, that's okay. I got the answer. Probably somewhere around, what, 150, 200,000? Not a bad guess. $100,000. You actually shot a little bit high. You're kind of surprised. <laughs> I'm just figuring mortgages and that kind of thing. But... Yeah, $100,000 is what we're talking about. Um, approximate average household debt is what we're looking at. Uh, now, here's a funny little experience I have that's related to this. Um, when I was in high school, I had a teacher uh, that said, and mind you, I'm, I'm not saying anything against college education right here. That's not the point of the story. But she said it is worth it to go to college because college is more affordable than ever. In fact, it is so easy to get a student loan. And interest rates are so low these days. Now, wait, wait, wait. Did I forget about what the definition of affordable was? She said that you could afford college if you took out a loan. If you have to take out a loan, by definition, that means it's not affordable. You don't currently have the money to pay for it. And yet, that is what we do to ourselves. We say, I can afford that television. I can afford that house. I can afford that phone. I can afford anything that I want if I just put it on credit. As a result, we enslave ourselves to paying off debt. What if we did things God's way? What if we listened and obeyed the words of Jesus? And I love his illustrations. And we can learn a lot from his illustrations. He said, look at the birds. They don't even know how to grow food, let alone store it away. But God still takes care of them. And don't misunderstand this either. He wasn't saying it's okay to be lazy. He wasn't saying sit around and God will provide for you and bring all the stuff to you that you need. To the contrary, if you work hard and you prepare for the winter by storing up, you have nothing to worry about. God takes care of the birds who don't know how to do these things. How much more do you think he'll provide for you? What about the grass in the fields? Don't they have beautiful flowers? How did the flowers get that way? They didn't make their own clothes. They didn't buy their own clothes. They didn't live in king's courts or anything of that sort. They don't even know what pretty looks like. But look at them. They are more beautifully clothed than the richest of kings. And it's because God has made them beautiful. How much more will God, who loves you, make you beautiful? Provide clothing for you to provide with dignity and accentuate your beauty. Why do we lack the faith to understand these things? We lack faith. After all, Jesus said that the pagans run after these things. And you know what? These things, again, are not bad. These are not bad things. And if you want them, you can have them. But don't chase after them. Don't covet foreign treasures. Don't idolize and sell all your possessions to gain any one of these material items. A while back, I received some great advice 
This uh, gentleman told me, when you are planning on making a serious life change, don't take just any opportunity. Make sure that the reason you are making that change isn't because you are running away from something. Make a change because you are running to something. And when I say this, I'm referring, at least I'm thinking of, what we refer to as the pearl of great price. Matthew 4, uh, I'm sorry, 13, 45 through 46, Jesus said, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Now that must be a very valuable pearl for him to sell everything in order to have it. What on earth could possibly be so valuable? The answer? In reality, nothing. <laughs> to buy a pearl? Nothing is that valuable. Nothing on earth. Jesus is the pearl of great price. Jesus is the pearl of great price. He is all that we need for our lives to be complete, fulfilled, and worthwhile. But back to the pearl. For this merchant to be so motivated to chase after the pearl, it wasn't that he despised all of his possessions so much that I just got to get rid of these things. No, that was not what he was doing right there. He wanted that pearl that bad that none of those other things that he had, none of the wealth, none of the treasures, none of his possessions, none of those things mattered anymore. He had to run to the pearl. He knew he would be a fool to let this valuable item slip through his fingers. Mankind is looking for something as well. Everybody is. Some people fear letting something slip through their grip. Others search for something that they never want to let go of. We want joy. We want peace. We want happiness. We want love. Jesus fulfills all these longings. And we would be fools to let him get away from us. And yet, he's not in our hands. <laughs> we are in his hands. Isn't that wonderful to think that? To believe, to know that. He's not in our hands. We're in his hands. I think of the chorus, the popular hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. It says, great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. I know my singing voice isn't up to... <laughs> morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. With a God like that, why should we worry? It makes Jesus' final words for this segment ring all the more clear and make all the more sense. And that's Matthew chapter 6, verse 34. I almost feel like it should be 35. Regardless, last verse inside of the chapter there. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And this came from man who knew how to number his days, who knew of the dreadful fate that he would endure. And yet, he could say, Lord, great is thy faithfulness. I will not dread tomorrow, for you have mercies yet today. We can feel comfortable casting our burdens upon him, because he is always so good. Please bow your heads with me in a word of prayer. Father God, great is your faithfulness. Because even when we're lacking in faith, you're able to strengthen us. You're able to encourage us. You're able to restore ourselves to you. So that we won't have the fears and we won't have the anxieties. Lord, things of this life can choke us up, can slow us down, can prevent us from having the faith that we should have. 
that we get so worried of losing these things that we forget to serve the God that we love. Father God, let that never be the case. Let us always remember you, your goodness, and all you've done for us in the past, knowing that if you provided that way back then, we can trust you, provide for us now and in the future. Great is your faithfulness, O God. We praise you. We thank you for providing for us. In the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.